Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So this video is going to be a walkthrough of both the exams for the Economics of Entrepreneurship class. And I'm going to probably try to go through it relatively quick because I'm super impatient because I had just recorded this video and then realized my mic had died. Evidently it's working now, so hopefully it didn't happen again. But I'm a little bit annoyed, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the round two of the video since the previous one had no sound but anyway so hope you like this video liking is always a free way to support what i am doing here but anyway so uh all right the first portion of exam one had to do with uh kind of multiple choice questions that were conceptually based off of what we covered in class right that's kind of the idea so firstly once your product launched other entrepreneurs realize there's a lucrative profits that they might want want to try to capture as well as a result of rivals entering the market, you anticipate your market share will fall. Some useful strategies might be offer a useful complement to your main product, advertise the merits of your product over those of entrance, work to make your demand curve more elastic, try to make your product as similar to rivals as possible, all of the above or both of the above. I actually accepted all of the above and both A and B. Um, wait, no, 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 here, sorry. Here, this is the one I'm confusing myself. There's uh, is two that I accepted both of them on. For goal of advertising, I accepted more than one of the above and all of the above. For one, I only accepted A and B. Offer a useful complement to your main product. Advertise the merits of your product over those of any new entrants. Yeah, I'm not going to stop this video or edit that out because I've already made this whole video in its entirety and it was awesome, but nobody's going to see it because it doesn't have any sound. Anyway, so work to make your demand curve more elastic. No, that's not. That's exactly the opposite. You want to make your rival's demand curve more elastic. You want to make your demand curve more inelastic. Right, you want to <clears throat> excuse me. You want to convince yourself, you con convince your consumers that there's not a lot of legitimate substitutes to uh, to your product. Try to make your product similar to your rival as possible, so you can avoid price competition. That's the opposite result. The more similar that you are, the more fierce is price competition. You try to be dissimilar to your rivals to try to, uh, to try to in increase product differentiation to allow you to have a positive markup, price above marginal cost. All right, so a goal of advertising is make your demand curve more inelastic and your rivals more elastic. Yep, that follows from what we set up here. Increase the maximal willingness to pay for consumers of your product. Yep, higher vertical intercept for your product for your market. Increase the size of your market. Yep, larger horizontal intercept. Uh, compete with your rivals without doing so using prices. Yep, through non-price strategies. More than one or all the, yeah, I meant to write this one differently, but it is, yeah, more than one is correct. And it's also specifically all of the above. But no one lost points for saying more than one of the above. Uh, all right, so as discussed in class, at its core, entrepreneurship is fundam fundamentally about innovation, creating a brand story, applying economics to the best of our abilities, or redirecting resources from lower value uses to higher valued ones. Yeah, it's the last one. You might have wanted to say innovation, and innovation is certainly important for entrepreneurship. There's no question about that. But at its core, it's really about the goal of redirecting resources to higher valued uses. That's the point of like focused innovation, is that you're trying to be able to eliminate inefficiency. So you could think of like Airbnb, or you could think of Uber, you could think of uh, you know Lyft, and yeah, there's a little bit of innovation involved in terms of the app, the software, and everything. But fundamentally, it's about eliminating transactions costs, right? To try to and eliminating the the inefficiency of idle capital. It's redirecting idle capital resources from lower valued uses to higher valued ones or if i was gonna start a uh, start a window washing business i'd be redirecting lower valued use of water sitting in people's pipes to the side of their house to clean up their windows right and that wouldn't involve much innovation at all which of the following are important to performing the value-added analysis? Identifying number of rivals and nature of competition. Now, that's Portis Five Forces. Determining whether or not a monopoly is legal in the market in question. I mean, in most cases, the monopoly is going to be perfectly legal. It's just going to be maybe some of the practices, some of the pricing practices might be questionable in the eyes of antitrust authorities, but that's not relevant for value-added analysis. Investigating whether it's possible to produce the good or service at low cost relative to consumers' willingness to pay. Yeah, that's the key, right? So value added, we want to think about are consumers willing to pay a lot for this product, right? Above what it costs to bring it to the market, right? So like, it's not just the demand, it's also the cost, right? A lot of people would want to pay a lot for a flying car, uh, but we don't have flying cars because it would cost too much to, to uh, manufacture and at the societal level. Actually, I would pay kind of a lot to have other people not have flying cars because I think it'd be a mess. <laughs> but anyway, uh, consider some product or service for which consumers are wary about making a purchase and might delay buying 
or avoid buying altogether, they don't want to make the wrong decision, overwhelmed by choices, unable to determine exactly which version would be useful to them or which version they actually uh, have received after having made the purchase. This is, oh, it's a credence good. That's where you don't know what it is that you require nor what you've received after the service or product has been rendered to you. So for instance, like medical treatments or home repairs, car repairs, uh, if you're buying specialized equipment and you you aren't familiar with whatever this equipment is, right? Like you go to a, you go to a specialty bike shop because you want to be able to go on bike rides on a local trail. You know you don't necessarily know unless you're already familiar with with cycling which of the many bikes would be would be a good fit for you. Do you need a high end one? Do you need a, me, a medium one or just a really basic? Do you even need to be buying your bike from a specialized bike shop or could you just buy one from Target or Walmart or something like that, right? It's a credence good if you don't have information. All right, so uh, in general, it's easy to get customers to believe the claim the product you're selling is good. No, that, that's false. Uh, it's pretty easy to try to lie and say that you've got a good product or your product tastes great. Uh, consumers aren't going to believe this. However, if there's scope for repeat purchases, that can kind of reinforce the claim because then there's greater returns to advertising that you've got a good product when you can get repeat purchases in addition to uh, word of mouth and uh, referrals and then uh, new purchases in the next period anyway. It's possible to capture the market as a monopolist, but nevertheless be undercut by rivals if you try to set the price according to where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Sure, yeah, that'd be if we had a small innovation, right? So like you capture the market because you've got lower costs, but your single price monopoly price still lies above everybody's, all the incumbents, the current firm's costs. Then if you try to set the monopoly price, since they're still in the market, you'd be undercut. That wouldn't be very profitable. Instead, what would you do? You'd undercut them, but because your costs are presumably quite a bit lower, you're able to have positive economic profits, though not necessarily true monopoly profits, right? So this is true here. All right, question 10. I like the structure of this question. It's sort of a clever one. So you've got two segments to serve, price is equal to four minus one half Q, and then price is equal to four minus one quarter Q. Your marginal costs are, are two regardless of who you sell to. If the advertising elasticity is two for both market segments, find the optimal advertising expenditure for each market segment, right, at the respective single monopoly price. So we need the advertising elasticity, um, so the, the formula relating advertising elasticity to price elasticity of demand, which is equal to the ratio of your ideal sale or advertising expenditure to your sales, right? Just revenue. And then we also need um, price elasticity of demand formula, which is DQ DP times P over Q. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is find our monopoly profit maximizing price and quantity. So if this is the inverse demand, then MR equals MC is gonna be four times Q, or sorry, four minus Q equals two, solving. This gives me a quantity of two. The respective price is gonna be three, just evaluating my demand at the monopoly quantity of three. Over for this segment of demand, it's gonna be four minus one half Q is equal to two, is marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Quantity is four, the respective price is three. Here I've computed the elasticity at these points, right? You can kind of think of elasticity as like slope at a point. It's a little bit misleading. It's not quite what elasticity is. I mean, elasticity is like responsiveness to changes in price um, in terms of changes in quant resulting changes in quantity demanded, but that gives you kind of an idea and helps you remember the formula. Here is the slope of the demand curve. The first one is minus two, and then the point was, the price was three and the quantity was two. So we get an elasticity of three or in absolute value at the monopoly profit maximizing price for market one and of three at the monopoly profit maximizing price and quantity for segment two. Solving for the respective proportion or uh, uh, expenditure on advertising, we'll get four for the first market, eight for the second market. Okay, so uh, question nine was a two part tariff question. Suppose you have two distinct segments, you have 100 customers in each. The first market is gonna be demand given by eight minus two P. 100 customers represented by demand 16 minus 4p. Your costs are going to be 2q regardless of who you sell to. You want to use two-part tariff strategy. All right, so here is going to be the first market. I've converted my demand into inverse demand because that's the one that we that's the one that we graph. It's the same relationship. It's just price in terms of quantity rather than quantity in terms of price, right? So we graph pr price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. So I didn't label that a little bit better. And then here's in the second segment. Right, so the vertical is gonna be four in both cases. The uh, horizontal intercept is gonna be 16 in the large one, eight in the, in the smaller one. For this first one, we have to sell the same per unit price to all consumers and the same 
um, and the same fixed price for both groups. So we have a choice to make. We could set price equal to marginal cost and then set my fixed fee equal to whatever it is that my low group would maximally spend and equal like extract their consumer surplus. That's fine and I'd sell that to both groups. So it turns out if you calculate consumer surplus for the low group at mar when price is equal to marginal cost, one half base times height yields uh, four you know, time scaled up by 100, so we'd be able to extract a uh, fee of our fee profits of, uh, of 400 uh, from each group, but we'd also be able to get that from the large group, so total would be 800, so I could sell this to both groups. Or the consumer surplus of the higher group at price equals marginal cost would be eight, or scaling up, it's 800, but then you're only going to sell it to those 100 consumers. Either way, my profits are going to be 800, right? It's not going to matter which one that you do in terms of what happens to profits. I'm going to skip ahead to part C. This is where you can separate the two groups and offer each its own per unit and fixed price. Oh, that's like if I could say, oh, this group, price equals marginal cost, and then their fixed fee is 400. This group, price equals marginal cost, their fixed fee is 800. So I get total profits of 1,200, right? So that's all this was. So once you did A, then part C was really easy. Uh, part B, suppose you offer the same fixed price to both groups, but are free to set any per unit price. Okay, so find the optimal per unit price and quantity. You don't have to set price equal marginal cost. Oh, here I had the restriction of price being marginal cost. Um, anyway, so I'm going to write up profits as a function of price. So the profits are going to be my 200 consumers times my fixed fee, which is going to be based off of consumer surplus of the smaller group, because intuitively what we're going to do is we're going to raise the price above marginal cost. Right, so it's going to give us some positive per unit profits, and then we're going to shrink the fixed component. Right, but we don't want to shrink it. Even if we started with the large group and started shrinking it, we still wouldn't grab all of the all the consumers in the small group until it reached the the, the size of the fee that they'd be maximally willing to pay a 400 anyway. So let's let's make the fixed fee based off of the small group. Then from the get go, we know we're selling to both groups, 200 rather than 100. So that's what we're doing here. All right, so that's the fixed component. Here's the per unit profits. It's going to be 100 times markup as price minus marginal cost, price minus 2, and then the demand from the lower group, plus 100 times markup times demand from the higher group. So this is per unit profits from the low group. Here's per unit profits from the high group. If I had fixed costs, I'd subtract them off here. Then I clean up a little bit, find d, q or d pi dp, and then find my solve the first order condition for the optimal price, which is 2.5 and then evaluate my fee, my fixed component, my consumer expression for consumer surplus of the low group at that price and find it's 2.25. Now, if you if you go through this, I recommend you know starting with this profit function right here, then using an iteration of the product rule, right? So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second for both of these groups. You could alternatively FOIL, but then you got a lot of terms flying around. So that's why I did it this way. So I don't know, maybe you wanna like pause the video and kind of look at how I did that. This is the way that I'd recommend doing it just because I was able to do this in one, two, three, four, four lines pretty quickly. But I mean, whichever way, you know, there's mathematically it's correct to FOIL first, or there's, there's actually some other algebra I could have done here to make it a little simpler. I didn't want to do that because I wanted to make this clear that this is per unit profits, right? I could factor out 100, 100 times P minus two, right? And then have sum up these things, collect like terms. That'd make it way easier in terms of algebraically, but it would kind of destroy some of the economic intuition. Anyway, if you calculate profits, it's 975. And then just a, a sort of check step is you want to look to see your profits for this one, where you're finding the optimal price and fixed price. It's going to be higher than what you could do if you're just sending a single fixed price, or per unit price equal to marginal cost, and then fixed price for whichever fixed fee, tariff, or whichever the two groups, but it's going to be less than the situation where you're giving everybody their own tariff, right? Where This is like third degree price discrimination where you can isolate the two groups. It's like two part tariff for children, two part tariff for adults or something, or visitors versus locals. Anyway, that's what happens here. This is the gold standard one. It's going to be the highest profits, 1200 versus 975 versus, you know, 800, however you decide to do that one. All right, next one, consider network good. We got 20 million consumers uniformly distributed from one to 20. So maximum willingness to pay is 20. Size of the market is 20. My demand curve is gonna be prices equal to 20 minus Q, right? But then it's not really my demand curve. That's just the linear component. 
it's got this network effect, so it's going to be the valuation portion times n for you know number of consumers in my network, and overarching valuation is going to be like price is equal to v times, um, uh, sorry, price is equal to v n, right? Anyway, so that expression becomes, and this follows from the quadratic demand lecture video I did, twenty minus two the 20 minus n times the quantity 20 minus n times n minus 36. This becomes this nice quadratic. Here I've used the quadratic formula minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac times 2a, right? And then just solving, we find network size of 2, 18, and 0. If half a million sign up, this is going to collapse to 0 because the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefit at 1 half, actually, until you reach, until you go beyond 2. If 5 million sign up, now the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, so this will kick us all the way up to the larger equilibrium. All right, market demand is 4 minus 1 half Q. Initial marginal costs are 2.5 for all firms. Suppose one firm innovates and drives its cost down to 2. What will the firm's optimal price and quantity be? All right, so just as solving for monopoly. Uh, quantity MR equals MC you get a quantity of 1.5 the associated price is 3.25 oh that's higher than the incumbents marginal cost so you can't set a price at 3.25 because you got a lot of firms able to price all the way down to 2.5 who will undercut you so what do you do instead you take advantage of your lower cost of 2 versus their cost of 2.5 by pricing at 2.5 minus epsilon which is like 2.49 right 2.49 all right, so suppose one firm innovates and drives, that would be a small innovation. Suppose one firm inv innovates and drives it cost down to one, what will be the firm's optimal price and quantity? So it did the same exercise. Now we find the monopoly price is actually gonna be 2.5, which matches their costs. So again, I'm gonna price 2.5 minus epsilon, but in this case, you're essentially a single price monopoly. You're epsilon away from it. So it's so here, we're in, the, in part A, we're pricing at like 249 because we have to undercut the people selling at 250 and our costs were only two, so we're getting a, a markup of 0.49 on our 1.5 units, which could be millions or whatever. It doesn't have to be like one and a half units. It could be one and a half million units. Uh, in part four, or sorry, part B, worth four points, uh, now we're selling a quantity of three, but our monopoly price is 2.5, so we're getting actually single price monopoly profits because the markup is gonna be what? You know, 1.49 right here because the costs were one. Uh, this is just the same page. Sorry, I didn't mean to include that in there. Uh, question 12, consider the price for a meditation app, $6 per month for basic, uh, pre-recorded sessions, and then 15 per month for premium with live sessions. Here's the willingness to pay table. So type A are willing to pay $10 for basic, 20 for premium. Type B are willing to pay $7 for basic, 10 for premium. At these prices, you can cons compute consumer surplus. Remember, there's two problems. We don't want the low demanders to leave the market. We don't want the high demanders to pretend to be low and just buy the basic. So we're asked, are we currently optimizing? Well, no, because we actually raised the price of the basic option. Because currently, consumer surplus for my basic demanders is positive one. They would have been willing to pay seven. We're actually only charging them six. So we could raise the price for them. Turns out, actually, at the price of 15, Right, consumer surplus for type A when they buy the premium is five from 20 minus 15 is consumer surplus of five. That's more generous than it had to be, right? Because at the price of four, of six even, their consumer surplus is four, because uh, they would have paid 10, we'd be asking them to pay six, their consumer surplus is four. We could actually even just raise the price from 15 to 16, and then if we kept the price at $6 per month for the basic version and raised this price to 16, now they're indifferent between the two. So that would even be a change. But it turns out there's something better we could do. Better thing is let's make our low demanders exactly indifferent between buying and not buying. So let's set the price of the basic uh, app at seven. And then you know their consumer surplus is zero, but that's fine. We'll break the tie in favor of the economic activity. So we'll say they'll buy. What about our higher group? Well, their consumer surplus, because remember, with second degree price discrimination, this is like you go to a restaurant and everybody sees the same menu. And you and your friends order different things, get different bills because it's an interaction of your own preferences and your budget, right? But you could, if you wanted to, buy the same meal as everybody else, right? And so that's what's happening here is all of our consumers could face the same prices. They could buy whatever they want, they could. It's just that they're gonna do whatever is gonna fit them best. And so in this situation, 
because the price of $7 for the basic version is out there and our type A consumers are not prohibited from buying basic at $7 and because their consumer surplus would be $3, the difference between their willingness to pay of 10 and the actual price of seven, uh, we have to make sure that they have consumer surplus of at least $3 when they buy the premium version. So we can't price premium any higher than $17. Right? If you actually want to make them strictly prefer the premium version, you'd have to set maximal price for the premium at 17 minus epsilon. Right? Okay, then we had the Porter's Five Forces. Zoom Pizza was my favorite entrepreneurship example because they had these automated robots. There's a lot of, you could look on um, YouTube, here's got a lot of videos on Zoom for um, talking about their structure. They had robots to make their pizza. They had some degree of automation in their delivery where they had an algorithm that would anticipate when pizza were gonna be ordered in a particular zip code. So it'd be nice and piping hot by the time it got there. They'd, they'd anticipate your order before you even placed it. It was how it was supposed to work. 54 ovens in every truck that was delivering these things. It was amazing. They've gone out of business, right? Uh, okay, so here's the Portis Five Forces to look at what might have caused some problem from them. Rivalry, it was high, right? Rivalry for delivery pizza, really high. There's Domino's, Little Caesars, Papa John's, uh, Marco's might deliver, a whole bunch, right? Uh, Zoom Pizza was in the Bay Area, so I'm not exactly sure what the profile would be around Bay Area, but there's a lot of firms, and I'm sure most, if not all, the ones that I just mentioned operate in Bay Area, right? Uh, entry, I put this as low, it's actually a high threat. It's easy to enter but it's a high threat from entry because all you need to do to have delivery pizza is a large enough oven, a license to be able to operate and then deliver, and then uh, vehicles, right? So, you know, many restaurants that serve pizzas on their menu could decide to do delivery pizza, right? So entry would be really easy. Buyers have, it's a low threat because you're getting pretty small orders. Sellers, medium, you actually need to have reliable ingredients. So I wouldn't say it's low. I mean, there's lots of different producer or you know, potential places that you can obtain pizza ingredients from, but to be able to get fresh ingredients and then have it sort of reliable, uh, there's only a certain number of vendors in a given region that you could work with. So I'd say a medium threat there. Uh, substitutes, well, there's lots of food options. So substitutes are when you're looking outside of the industry, right? Rivalry is within the industry. So like American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, Delta Airlines, United Airlines are all rivals. A substitute to the airlines would be Zoom, right? So here, rivals would be Domino's, Papa John's, Pizza Hut, whatever. Uh, and then substitutes to those would be like um, if, like DoorDash or like delivery, um, if there's some type of delivery fast food, uh, right? So Zoom failed, what was the problem? I accepted a lot of different answers here, but the, the main thing I was kind of looking for was probably the oligopoly structure. It's probably really, probably, fierce rivalry and delivery pizza market. And though they were able to get a little bit of an edge and it was a little bit interesting with they were able to have this automation, it wasn't enough to be able to confer enough additional benefit versus the cost, right? Massive capital expenditure to be able to have those robots and automation. And they probably didn't have sufficient volume because it's already probably relatively low margin. All right, this moves us on to exam two. So exam two, there's three multiple choice. When antitrust officials uh, assess a practice as to whether it's a compelling business justification or if it's just for reducing competition, that's the rule of reason approach. Uh, per se illegal is like price fixing, the, then there's like no gray area, it's just like always illegal. Suppose you're negotiating with a dealer over a car you'd like to buy, worst negotiating position if the dealer has a high patience level, they're willing to take a long time to come to agreement, and a high reservation value because they're going to demand a high price, right? Other things equal, patience is a virtue, and um, you want your you you um, would want your seller to have a low reservation value because as a buyer you would want low prices. If you're operating a platform market, you want to relatively subsidize the group that benefits the other group, creating additional incentive for those high value customers to join. Right? So you'd offer free access if you're Google to browsing, and then you charge prices for advertisers that would like to show the advertisements to those using Google as a search engine. Uh, true or false, we know from a uh, class Odysseus tied himself to the mast to be able to experience the pleasing song of the sirens without jeopardizing the ship. Similarly, an incumbent can enter by announcing its, com its commitment to engage in a price war by building excess capacity after the rivals entered. No, that's too late. You'd have to announce this, you'd have to build the capacity before there is even a threat of entry. Right, it's too late to be credible, so that one's false. 
Uh, platforms like Facebook or Meta are unconcerned about consumers' attitudes towards advertisements because the product is free. Well, just because it's free doesn't mean like the true cost of using Facebook is zero, right? You want you want the true experience to be positive. If there's lots of advertisements or if it's like annoying content that people are going to leave, and then you need to subsidize uh, the customer base by giving free access or making it like a, sort of a good experience. Otherwise, you're going to have fewer consumers, and then that's going to be less you know, eyeballs on uh, advertisements that advertisers are trying to sell. So no, they actually do need to kind of care that they're not annoying their consumers. Uh, true or false, if DPA, DQA is negative, meaning price advertisers will pay is decreasing in the quantity of advertisements, the platform should limit the number of advertisements and raise the price to advertisers. I'd say true or uncertain, right? So the literal interpretation says there's a penalty to raising the quantity of advertisements. This is like flooding the site like flooding Facebook with advertisements. I mean, you know, I got rid of Facebook as soon as I started getting bombarded by Farmville and zombie whatever requests. You know, it's just annoying. Um, so, so, right, if this is true, then you probably actually want to limit the amount of advertisements and like nuisance things on your platform. Otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of customers. Instead, you should limit the quantity, you should raise the price, right? But it also depends on the relevant costs and on the elasticity. Suppose Craig Cruiser's an amusement park and arcade venue in West Michigan perceives entry by Ben's go-karts. Craig's estimates the price elasticity, cross price elasticity is around minus three. The negative sign indicates that there's a complementary relationship. The fact that it's greater than one in absolute value tells us it's pretty cross elastic, pretty responsive. So these are pretty close complements. So other things equal, yeah, uh, Craig's Cruisers should try to encourage entry, meaning they should try to not oppose entry at like the town council meeting or whatever, um, or whatever you can do to try to encourage entry. Yeah, they're substitutes to some extent. There's only so much entertainment budget and there's only so much time people are going to spend. However, there might be like, you know, as suggested by this complementary relationship, this strong complementary relationship, there might be some type of economy, agglomeration effects or... Uh, you know something where there's there's now a larger economic magnet that are pulling people to this neighborhood because now there's two venues for them to go to so that could kind of reinforce the complement story uh, suppose market demand for some product is given by q of p is equal to 14 minus p there's marginal cost at two total fixed cost at 12 find a monopoly profit maximizing price and quantity so this is just mr equals mc find the monopoly quantity it's six up uh, monopoly price is eight okay Find the Corneau profit maximizing price and quantity, you could use the Corneau shortcut. So I'm, I meant for this to be a duopoly. Corneau shortcut implies duopoly, right? But, um, you know, except if you had like a triopoly, that's interesting too. But here's a, du here's a duopoly. So A minus C over three was our Corneau equilibrium quantity, right? So here A was 14, right? That's the vertical intercept of the demand curve. Uh, C, marginal cost was two. And then the number of firms, N plus one, Right, so n was two plus one is three. Right, so uh, the Cournot quantity in equilibrium would be four each firm because it's a symmetric Cournot problem. If we make these assumptions, the price would be six. Uh, is setting four likely to be an effective limit price? Well, so there's positive markup, so that's good. Uh, limit price is what the monopoly does prior to entry. So what's the monopoly going to do at the price of four? It's going to get profits of eight because the revenues are going to be twenty. Whoops, uh, profits from per unit profits are going to be 20. And then the fixed costs were 12, so now total profits are only 8. What happens if another firm enters? Optimistically, the price would stay at 4, though probably it would actually lower. But let's just look at the best case scenario for our entrant. The price stays at 4. We split the monopoly output of 10, uh, so we're each producing 5. So now the markup is going to be 4 minus 2. Okay, so that's 2 times 5 is 10. Oh, but the fixed costs were 12, so now we got negative profits. Yeah, this would be an effective limit price. This suggests there's not room for two firms. Does setting price equal to four con constitute predatory pricing? No, nah, because this isn't price below marginal cost. We'd have to know something about the dynamic long run marginal cost. Maybe it's possible that the long run marginal cost rises, but this that, that wouldn't typically be what we'd expect with predatory pricing. We'd expect pricing below marginal cost would be what would constitute pred predatory pricing, which is illegal. Uh, solve for the equilibrium of a negotiating game. So this is Three quarters bull, one half bull, one fourth bull, according to this bargaining scheme. A offers, B accepts, rejects. B counter offers, A accepts, rejects, and so on and so forth. Or game two, full bull, full bull, no ice cream, right? A makes an offer over the full bull, B makes an offer over the full bull. Uh, game three, full bull to half a bull to none. 
All right, so the way that we solve this is we go to the end of the game. Let me solve C first because it's the easiest. If we go to the end of the game, there's half a bowl left. B makes an offer of keeping half to themselves and giving none to A. A is going to accept. That's what the economic theory is going to say because A is going to be indifferent between getting zero from being offered zero versus getting zero because there's no ice cream left. Right? We can even make this a small number. We can make this epsilon so that A strictly prefers accepting this admittedly bad offer to not getting anything at all. But if this is what happens, then when A is making their decision in round one, they're going to realize, wait a second, if we don't come to an agreement, B is for sure going to guarantee themselves half a bowl. So we have to offer B half a bowl here, which means we can only keep half a bowl for ourselves. So it's going to be one half, one half, accepted immediately. Following that logic for game two or for B, the full bowl of ice cream is going to be B offers to take it themselves and give zero to A. A should be indifferent between getting giving you know getting nothing from this offer versus getting nothing because they failed to come to an agreement. And if we don't like that, we could make you know we could give a small taste like one of those trial sample spoons to to A, right? And to make them slightly prefer that to no ice cream left. But anyway, so knowing that B can guarantee themselves the entire bowl, then the offer that one that A has to make in period one is all the ice cream to uh, to uh, B, otherwise B will just reject in in uh, in period one. All right. So what about here? Quarter bowl left. A is or B is going to make the offer of none to A, one fourth of the bowl, all of it to B. So in period three, when there's half a bowl left, A knows they have to give B at least a quarter of it. They can keep a quarter for themselves. That sums up to one half. So then in period two, when B is looking forward, they have three fourths of a bowl of ice cream. They see, oh, A is going to be able to guarantee themselves at least a quarter. So we have to give them a quarter that leaves half for us. So at the very beginning, at the outset, when there's a full bowl, A makes their offer. They're going to they're going to know that that B is going to get half. So they're going to have to offer half to B. They can keep half themselves. That'll be accepted immediately. Well, there's really no first mover advantage in these. There's arguably a second mover advantage in option B, right? Or sorry, yeah, item B, because that's where B does best. Uh, OK, so here's the entry entry scenario. So we have scenario one and two. Uh, in scenario two, there's a cost of entry of 40,000 that's reflected in the payoffs that I've got here. Scenario one, if both enter, they each get five. If only one enters, they get 60, the other gets zero. If And then the same thing if firm one doesn't enter, but firm two enters. This is an E here, sorry. Then firm one gets zero, firm two gets uh, 60. And then if no one enters, then they both get zero. The first number goes to player one. The second number goes to player two. And then in scenario two, if they both enter, they both lose 10. It could be $10 million. That could be catastrophic. Uh, if only one enters, they get 20. Whoever didn't enter gets zero, right? And if no one enters, they get zero. Let's solve by backward induction. So we'll go to the end of the game. And here, player two, when called upon to play, is going to say, oh, <laughs> If I enter, I get five. If I don't enter, I get zero. Five is bigger than zero, so I'm entering. If they observe that player one has not entered and they enter, they get 60. If they don't enter, they get zero. 60 is bigger than zero, so they'll enter. Player two has a dominant strategy to enter. They're always going to enter. It's always the best response. So player one looking forward says, oh, wow, either we're going to get five, because if we enter, they enter, or we'll get zero, because if we don't enter, they will enter. We'd rather enter, so the Nash equilibrium indeed, backward, sell by backward induction is enter, enter. And they each get payoffs of five. All right, option two, or scenario two. Uh, now at the very end of the game, when player two is called upon to play, zero is bigger than minus 10. So if player one enters, player two is not gonna enter. If player two doesn't enter, sorry, if player one doesn't enter, now player two does enter, because 20 is bigger than zero. Player one looking forward is going to say, OK, if we enter, we're going to get 20. If we don't enter, we're going to get 0. Let's enter. And then we'll force player two not to enter. So the Nash equilibrium here is enter, not enter. Clearly, that's what player that's what the player would, would prefer. So given the opportunity, they would, sit, they would take actions. They'd maybe uh, build out capacity or quality or something, and try to get regulations or whatever in this industry to make it a situation where there's some fixed cost and endogenous sunk cost of entry. 40,000 because then in the equilibrium you're going to get 20 versus previously you're accommodating entry and getting five. Yeah, so scenario f two would be preferred for the reasons I've just mentioned. Following payoff metric matrix depicts the outcomes when the two businesses interact in a strategic game. Uh, the two strategies, high and low. The first number goes to row player. The second number goes to column player. 
find the Nash equilibrium if this is played once. There's actually two, it's high, high and low, low. Um, I made a mistake here, I, made it, I gave us a coordination game. I wanted to give us this game right here where there's a dominant strategy to price low. Nevertheless, it's still interesting. I mean, it's a broken question. You really need a dominant strategy to, um, to have this, to, to price low to be able to have this punishment and tacit collusion structure. Uh, actually, what do we need to do to get tacit collusion? right or to get collusion well you just got to be pricing high because in this game if you're pricing high your co-player is going to figure out that they better price high as well and then eventually you're just always pricing high forever that'll be stable this is a coordination game meaning if we're already both pricing high or if we're already both pricing low there's not going to be any reason to deviate pricing high is obvious because it's the highest <laughs> highest payoffs in the game but what about pricing low well if you're both at low remember how you can how you can switch right so for down here column player has selected low row player has selected low what if row player changes if row player moves to the top row prices high instead of low now they've reduced their payoff by two right what if uh, you know row players pricing low and column player is choosing between continuing to price low or switching to high they can switch to high column player can switch from low to high when row player is pricing low but then they also lower their, lower their payoff from uh, five to two or five to three Remember, that's the definition of a Nash equilibrium. Both are mutually best responding. Yeah, they would both like to be at high, high, but if you're currently at low, low, you can't get there alone. You don't have a unilateral um, profitable deviation. Uh, does anyone ever actually employ this punishment? In this game, no, right? There's no scope for punishment actually in this game. Uh, in the game that I intended, where there'd be a dominant strategy to price low, and there would be a punishment strategy. It'd basically be price high until somebody prices low, then price low for some period of time to make having price low less attractive, right? Then the then the gain of going from eight to twelve, the increase of four. It's got to cost them. You got to lose more than four. Actually, it turns out um, if if successful and if credible, then uh, players would just always cooperate because they know that the punishment could um, would. They know that they'd be punished if they were to deviate, and that'd be worse than just always cooperating. So it turns out, even in the game I'd intended, in lots of these situations, the theoretical prediction is that there should never be any punishment. Although you should definitely punish if you see defection. Um, again, collusion's like illegal. The, the reason why we'd expect, why we cover it in the class is we think, well, maybe our entrepreneur is entering an industry where there's already some type of collusion. Firstly, do they have an antitrust case that they can bring against the incumbents? Secondly, uh, do are they correct in their assessment about how favorable it is to enter that market in the first place, right? All right, so suppose market demand for some service is 4,500 minus Q, requires marginal cost of 300 to offer the service, market served by two firms. All right, so we're looking for Stackelberg price and quantity. So Stackelberg starts off with our Stackelberg follower. So here's the profits for the Stackelberg follower. It's the market demand. It's the quantity, this gives us, sorry, this gives us revenue, and then this is costs, right? Just cleaning this up really nice, finding d pi d q f gives us the first order condition. Here is the follower's reaction to the leader's choice. This is a reaction curve or best response function. I like writing it like this, 2100 minus one half QL, because it's algebraically simpler to drop this into the profit function than this thing with this big division bar. And that's how I solve all my Corneau is like when, when possible, when this thing is nicely divisible, but when this whatever is out here is nicely divisible by two, it doesn't have to be even, but if it's nicely divisible by two, then I'll, um, you know, then I'll make that division and then just deal with this one half here. Anyway, so then we go to our Stackelberg leaders profit function. It's going to be profit. Oh, I wrote this QL. This should be pi L as a function of their choice and the follower's choice as a function of their choice. So 4,500 minus QL minus the quantity governed by firm the follower's reaction curve and then times quantity minus 300 QL. This, this should be a QL. All right, cleaning up a little bit even before we take the derivative, we get down to something that looks like this, then we'll differentiate. This is like the run, the, yeah, this is, this is after some algebra, right? And then this is gonna be 2100 is equal to QL. But the algebra is simple. It's just like, when I say, I mean, it's actually just collecting like terms. So here's the follower, here's the leader's quantity. That's the monopoly quantity actually too. Then we find the, the profit maximizing price. It's not the monopoly price because you're gonna have some quantity sold by the follower, right? This 10, uh, 1050, because if we produce 
2100, the follower's reaction was going to be 2100 minus 1 half times 2100, or 2100 minus 1050, or just 1050. So the price is 1350. The followers' profits are 1350 minus 300, which is 1050 times 1050, which is this is price minus average total cost. That whole thing times the quantity. That's what this. That's why I wrote profits this way. So here's their profits. Here's the leader's profits: 1350 minus 300 uh, times 2100. Right, it's double the profits. Then part six or part B. Here's kind of a brilliant question, I think. It's like, what if rather than being Stackelberg Duopolis, we're considering like buying out or merging with our rival, right? When does it make sense to do this? Well, let's compare monopoly profits if we were to be able to buy out and merge with that firm versus our Stackelberg leader profits. So our monopoly profits, I calculate this right here, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It's a quantity of 2100. We knew that already because our Stackelberg leader will produce the monopoly quantity. Then I find the associated price, calculate my profits, oh, it's 4.4 .4 million essentially, versus my Stackelberg profits as leader, 2.2 .2 million. So the max that I would pay would be the difference. I could buy out my rival for 2.205 you know, million. Why would I not want to pay more than that? Well, because then I'm you know, worse off than I would have been just as a Stackelberg leader, which would be the status quo. What about the Stackelberg follower? They're gonna get profits right here, 1.1 million. We have to pay them at least that much, otherwise they'd rather stay in the market. So to, what's the minimum compensation the entrant would accept they bought out? So we'd buy them out for at least 1.1 million, but not above 2.2 .2 million, right? All right, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm gonna go ahead and conclude here, and I sure hope that the audio worked on this edition of the video. Uh, you can like, that's a free way to support what I'm doing here. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.